1666, a small fire started in a bakery in eastern London. At the time, houses were built of wood and were put really close together, so the fire spread quickly. The Lord Mayor was called on to decide if buildings should be demolished to stop the fire from spreading. Nah, he said, let's not do that. The fire seems quite small. I bet they had a pretty rough week after that decision, because the fire continued to spread. It raged for several days. When it finally was extinguished, it had destroyed the homes of 70,000 of London's 80,000 inhabitants. Wow. This is a planarian. It's a kind of flatworm. They are amazing creatures. If you cut them in half, they will continue to live on, and they will actually regenerate this lost half. You can cut it in tiny pieces, and it will regenerate. That's some amazing resilience. Today, I will show you how to build your microservices less like London in 1666, and more like a planarian flatworm. I will do this by first discussing why we need to build fault-tolerant services. I will show you some typical failure modes in a microservices setting. I will describe three stability patterns to mitigate the effects of these failure modes, and also provide some short monitoring guidelines for a microservices system. So my name is Christopher Ellenson. I work as a developer at Avanza. Do we have any Avanza customers here? Uh, almost as good as at JFocus, maybe about half. Great. So at Avanza, we, we are an online bank that provides services for uh, managing your savings and investments. We run a scalable services, microservices platform with uh, more than 250 services running in over 1,000 instances. And this platform allows us to be the largest actor on the stock on stock exchange, both in the terms of number of deals made and the total turnover. Today I will tell you a story about when I was working at Acme Books. This story is fictional, it's all made up, but it's quite similar to the experiences we have had at Avanza. But talking about Acme Books allows for more colorful examples and an easier to understand domain. So Acme Books, it's an online bookstore that sells antique, antique books. When we launched our service at Acme Books, we started out quite small with a typical setup with a web application connected to a database. This worked great when we had a few customers. But the demand for antique books were quite large, so we got more and more customers. Occasionally, we got some performance problems in the web application. Okay. We solve these problems by increasing the availability of the web application by adding more instances. We got even more customers and some more performance problems. This time, they were caused by a non-responsive database. The database was slow. OK, it's not very strange that problems in the database would manifest themselves in the web application. The database was used on every page, used for basically everything. We solved these problems by increasing the availability of the database by buying a larger database from a very expensive vendor. But business were even better. The money rolled in continuously. Great. But we reached a point where we couldn't scale anymore. We couldn't scale the database. We couldn't buy a larger database. We already had the most expensive one. And we also noticed that the development didn't scale. Everyone was working in the same web application, kept stepping on each other's toes we decided to make a switch to microservices to be able to develop the services independently and to be able to scale the services independently. We ended up with a system that looked part like this. There were a lot more services involved, but uh, a crucial part looked like this. Still, we had our web application, but instead of being connected just to the database, it was connected to three different services. One service for getting special offers to show for the customers, one service for getting the products that we sell, and a service for uh, making payments. So we launched this system under huge expectations. The services were on separate machines, and over-the-wire calls were made between them. So when we launched this, it held up for two hours. Then it started to burn. <laughs> started with a small fire, and it escalated. Web application didn't respond. Customers were complaining. 
restarted the web application in panic. Things were working for a couple of minutes, but then they went down again. The web application stopped responding. Okay, we need to investigate what's going on here. So we looked at the web application. It looked quite all right. Didn't do much at all. But we noticed that the calls it were making to the special offer service were hanging. The special offer service didn't respond. This was no big deal because the special offer service was just used for a separate page where we show special offers to the customers. Just nice to have functionality, so it didn't really matter if it didn't work. But this should not cause a web app outage. That's a problem. Okay, let's continue to dig here. The special offer service calls a third service, a purchase history service, to make decisions of which special offers to show based on what the user has bought. And this service has stopped responding. We had encountered a cascading failure, where the failure in one part of the system has cascaded to different parts. So this non-critical service for getting the purchase history for a user has stopped responding, and it ends up with the entire web application not responding at all. If we compare this to the case with the database stop responding, this is so much worse, because this is just nice to have functionality, a non-critical service. It shouldn't cause this kind of large-scale problems. So we want to prevent these kind of failures to affect the entire platform. What can we do? We start to discuss that. How about increasing the availability of our services? We can add more redundancy, do more code reviews, do more testing to make everything more stable. Yeah, we're assuming, we calculate that we could get each service instance to an availability of five nines. That would mean about five minute downtime per year. Yeah, that's great. Let's do that, we thought. But we had one smart developer who said, wait a minute, what if we get like 1,000 service instances like they do at Avanza? What happens then? If we have that, and we allow the failures to cascade freely in the system, then the combined availability becomes five nines to the power of 1,000. And this equals basically two nines availability, or 87 hours of downtime per year. Now this is quite significant. So in a system where we have many moving parts, like we will in a microservices system, we have to expect failures. There are a lot of moving parts that can fail. Failures will happen despite our best efforts to increase the availability. And hence, we need to design for failure. OK, so we realize that we have to design for these kind of failures, because just increasing the availability won't help us. We investigate the failure mode. What happened here when the purchase history service and the special offer service start stop responding? The web application that we run is a typical web application. It contains a, a thread pool with a fixed number of threads for handling the user requests. Each time a user makes a request to a page, it's assigned a thread from the thread pool. In the case of special offers, this thread makes the call to this service synchronously and wait for a reply. When everything works like it should, the service replies, and the response is propagated back to the user, who gets to the special offers page. Everyone is happy. But when the special offer service is slow, or not responding, then the thread will block waiting for a reply from the service. And while the thread is blocked waiting for a reply, it can't handle any other user requests. Okay, that's no big deal, because there are a lot of other threads in the thread pool that can handle requests that use other services and show other pages. It's still possible to browse the products and to make payments. But as more and more requests come into the special offers page, more and more threads will be blocked, until all threads are blocked. And this can be quite a quick process, because what does the user do when the page doesn't load? She hits refresh. If it still doesn't load, hit refresh a couple of more times, just hoping it will get better, right? So this can be quite quick, even for a rarely used page, because users keep refreshing. And when all the threads are blocked like this, additional requests will be enqueued, and they won't get a reply. 
And this is a really bad situation, because even if the service would be, would be restored and the threads would be unblocked, it would take a long time to recover, because we need to handle all the requests in the request queue. OK, we, we need to, to know here, why, why doesn't our service call return when the service is slow? That's the problem. What does the code look like that does this? It's basically pretty standard code. Creates a URL, makes a URL connection, gets an input stream from this connection, and reads the response from this stream. But why doesn't this return? Well, it appears that connect and read timeouts are typically infinite in Java. So if a service won't respond, this code never returns. And this made us realize the first stability pattern. Use timeouts. All service calls must be timed out. This will prevent blocked threads. In this very case, we could just add some timeouts on the URL connection, and problem solved. How you add your timeouts will depend a lot on which client library you use, because timeouts are set differently in all different libraries for making service calls. But in this instance, we could set our timeouts like this. And we also learned that we need to set aggressive timeouts. The shorter the timeouts are, the less risk of blocking a lot of threads and enqueuing requests. We need to also consider if the web application calls a lot of services as a part of one request. If we have long timeouts, the timeouts add up quite quickly. It's also a better user experience with a quick error and try again than have to wait for five, 10 seconds and then get an error. Okay, shouldn't we have timeouts here as well between the special offer service and the purchase history service? After all, it was the purchase history service that started acting up in the first place. Yes, absolutely, all service calls should have timeouts. In fact, the special offer service is just another web container, so we can apply the exact same discussion as we just did for the web application talking to the special offer service as the special offer service talking to the purchase history service. Okay, we had timeout for our service calls. We had a couple of more slow services that didn't respond, but the timeout saved us. The web application didn't become unresponsive at all. So things were great for about a month or two, until we had the next fire. Ah. We had terrible response times in the web application. And we had awful throughput in the web application. The number of requests we could handle per second was terrible. We just handled a few requests. OK, let's investigate. What has happened this time? Well, we see that uh, the calls to the special offer service, they time out, as they should. So that's working. Great. That's expected. But why do we get the bad throughput and the overall bad response times due to this? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of more calls to the special offer service than there has been in the past. So we get a lot of timeouts. So each, re each request here has to wait for a timeout. And what we see is that since the increased load to the special offer service, all the threads are spending most of the time waiting for this timeout to occur. And this makes the throughput go down the drain. The throughput becomes lower than the number of incoming requests. Say that we could uh, handle 30 requests per second, but we have uh, 40 requests per second incoming. Then we can't keep up with the load. We'll just get, get an increased queue with the request, which keeps growing and growing because we can't keep up with the number of incoming requests. So what had happened here? Why, why did we have a higher load to the special offer service than we had before? Well, it turns out that some developer thought it would be a good idea to put the special offers in the header of every page instead of a separate page. So this increased the load tremendously on this service. This couldn't handle that load and didn't respond anymore. Seemed like an innocent change at the time, but it brought down our entire system. So, for a frequent call service, timeouts are not enough. 
because if we call a service frequently and we have to wait for a timeout on each call, our throughput will be too bad. This leads us to the second stability pattern, circuit breakers. For non-developers, a circuit breaker is an electric switch which protects the circuit from overload. It detects overload and breaks the current. Similarly, in uh, software development, a circuit breaker protects services that behave badly from being overloaded and make the calls to them fail fast. So a circuit breaker detects if a service is slow or broken, and then it will prevent the calls from going through and instead return an error fast. That way we don't have to wait for a possible timeout. So calls to broken services fail fast and it offloads the broken services as well since we don't pass, pass the calls through. This is how a circuit breaker looks in real life. Pretty awesome. It doesn't look like this in code, unfortunately. A lot, lot more boring. I will show you in detail how the circuit breaker works. Consider the case where we have a web application talking to the special offers service. When everything is working like it should, the web application calls the service, which returns with a reply. Great. When the service is slow, instead of a reply, we wait for a bit, and then we get our timeout. What the circuit breaker does is it detects this timeout, and it opens the circuit breaker. So instead of waiting for the timeout, subsequent calls fail fast with an immediate error. By doing this, we have uh, basically solved the problem that we had, because every request doesn't have to wait for the timeouts. They return an error fast, because the circuit breaker is open. OK, but what if the service recovers? Then we probably want to call the service again to show the special offers. What the circuit breaker does is that it periodically lets a single call through. If this call fails, the circuit breaker is kept open and will fail fast continuously. But if this call succeeds, then we think the service is healthy again, and we close the circuit breaker and resume normal operations. One decision we have to make is when to open the circuit breaker, because opening it on one timeout is probably a bit naive, because there will be some jitters in the system, there will maybe be some garbage collection, so the occasional timeout will happen. But what we usually do is to decide a threshold. If more than 20% of our requests timeout, then let's open the circuit breaker and fail fast and let the service recover. We can also decide to open a circuit breaker if we have unhandled error over a certain threshold. If we get more than 50% unhandled errors, then we assume something is up. So let's open the circuit breaker and fail fast. Or we have a known irrecoverable error, like a machine is burning exception. I know that if we get this exception once, then there's no point in calling the service because we need to put out the fire first. So we can as well fail fast and open the circuit breaker. One additional problem we noticed when we put the special offers on every page was that when call Street were timing out or the circuit breaker was open, our web pages looked like this. Now that's not very user friendly. So we learned that we need to handle our service call errors. Since we need to expect our services to fail, we need to handle the errors gracefully. We can, for example, just catch all exceptions and return a sensible default. Like in the special offers case, if we get an exception we call the service, just don't show any, any offers at all. OK, so we implemented circuit breakers as well and timeouts. Our systems are a lot more stable. We have some failures and some slow services occasionally, but the problems don't cascade and bring the web application or other more critical services down. So we're quite happy for a while, until one day we get another fire. Oh, what's happened this time? We have implemented two stability patterns. Shouldn't we be safe now? The symptoms this time was terrible response times. 
an awful throughput in the web application. Again, haven't we solved problems that cause these symptoms with our circuit breakers? Okay, let's see what's happening. It's a special offer service again. <coughs> Can't these developers get anything right? So of course we fixed those bugs which caused all the slowness, but we also realized that, okay, now it was this service that failed like three or four times in a row, but it could be any other service. We need to be prepared for service failures, it doesn't matter which one that fails. It's a systematic problem that services cause cascading failures. This time it was responding slow, but it caused it didn't time out. And since the calls didn't time out, the circuit breaker didn't open, so we didn't get the fail fast behavior that the circuit breaker provides. And similarly, we had a lot of slow responses, so the thread spent most of the time waiting for this slow response, and it didn't do much other useful work. And we got a request queue. The throughput is lower than the number of incoming requests. Again, exact same symptoms as when we introduced the circuit breaker. <coughs> so when we have response times that are slow, but not as slow as to time out, then the circuit breakers are not enough to protect us. We need something more. We need bulkheads, which is the third stability pattern. Bulkheads are originally watertight compartments on a ship intended to protect the ship from being flooded if one part of the ship's hull is breached. In a software, it's a generic pattern to isolate components from each other to prevent cascading failures. One example of a bulkhead would be to limit the memory usage of a process so that it can just use a certain amount of memory. That way, if the process would have a memory leak, it wouldn't consume all the memory on a server and bring all the applications down. That's one example of a bulkhead. I'll talk about a specific type of bulkhead that is very useful in a microservices system that is a bulkhead to limit the number of concurrent calls to a service. If we put a limit on the number of concurrent calls from a client to a service, then we get an upper bound on the number of threads that are waiting for a reply from a service. And additional calls, when we have reached this limit, they will fail fast. Let me illustrate with a couple of images. Consider the web application and the special offer service. We add here a bulkhead with size two between them, which means that we let two concurrent calls from the web application to the special offer service. When we have two calls in progress, additional calls will fail fast. So any other calls to the special offer service will immediately fail. And this is experienced in different ways for the users, depending on which kind of thread the request is assigned. If a user is assigned a thread that is let through the circuit breaker when the service is slow, they will get a slow page load, but they will see the special offers in the header. If a user is assigned a thread that is blocked or rejected by the bulkhead, then they will get a fail fast, so they will get a fast page load, but they won't see the special offers. We will default to the empty offers but we will never have more than two threads waiting for a reply from this slow service. That way we have solved the problem where all the threads spend most of the time waiting for this service to reply. So bulkheads, they are put uh, one bulkhead per service on the client side. So in this case we have bulkheads to the special offer service, to the products and to the payment service from the web application. Three different bulkheads of three different sizes. And there's also one bulkhead between the special offer service and the purchase history service. So this type of bulkhead, they are extremely powerful. They protect very well against cascading failure, but only if the sizes of the bulkheads are significantly smaller than the request pool size. If the bulkhead size approaches the size of the request pool, let's say if we have 50 threads in the request pool and we have a bulkhead of size 45, then we can fill up that 45 threads, be waiting, calling a service, and we'll have five threads to handle additional work. 
and we're not very well protected, we can still get throughput problems. One way we can reason about uh, bulkhead sizes is to look at the peak load when healthy. So let's assume that we have a service that we're calling at 40 requests per second. And this service replies with the 0.1 seconds response time. Then one way to set a suitable bulkhead size would be to multiply these two values, multiply the request per second with the response time. So if we had a constant load with these parameters, we would manage with a bulkhead size of four. But since load isn't constant, there will be some jitters and there will be some differences in the request speed. We add some breathing room as well. So a suitable bulkhead size would be somewhere around seven. We really need to make these calculations this exact, but this is one way to think about it to set suitable sizes. A bonus with these types of bulkheads is that they protect services from overload. If a client goes crazy and calls the service as much as it can, it can still only make a fixed number of parallel requests to the service. So it's less risk of bringing the service down this way. One way to implement a bulkhead is to use a semaphore. A semaphore is a concurrency construct that limits the concurrent access to a resource. A semaphore is created with a number of permits, which means how many times the resource can be accessed concurrently. Here we create a semaphore of two, with two permits. And when we want to protect a service with this semaphore, we first try to acquire a permit from it. And we do this with a timeout of zero seconds. So if we don't are allowed to get this permit, then we will fail immediately, since the timeout is zero. If we succeed in acquiring this permit, then we go ahead and call the service. And we finally release the permit back to the semaphore. But if the acquire call returns false, it means that there are already two threads using the special offer service, two threads waiting for a reply. There are no permits left. We throw a rejected by bulkhead exception. Okay, now we've implemented bulkheads as well. Three stability pattern, timeouts, circuit breakers, bulkheads. Now we should be safe, right? Right? Yeah, hopefully. We have quit pretty safe for about half a year until Christmas shopping started. You know, Black Friday, everyone to want to buy their antique books for the best friends. So we got the next fire. Okay, what's happening this time? Symptoms are a bit different this time. There's still problems in the web application with throughput. But what we also see is that many threads are waiting for a reply in the web application. They're waiting for service calls to return. This leaves few available threads in the web application. And we also see that all calls to all our services are rejected by our bulkheads. So let's revisit how the bulkheads look. OK, we have one bulkhead for each service. We have each individual bulkhead is quite small, but all of them are full with blocked threads, which are waiting for a reply from our services. But you might recall that we introduced something to save us from having blocked threads waiting for service replies, like timeouts. Yeah, but where have they gone? The timeouts have disappeared. Service calls never return. They block indefinitely again. So the bulkheads are full of blocked threads. OK, that's bad. What's happened? Let's look at the code. We have introduced a new library. We don't make the URL connections directly anymore. We have a HTTP client, which we set some properties on to, to make calls time out. But in the release, someone upgraded this library. And apparently, they made an undocumented change how the timers are configured. They should be set like this now. But we didn't know about that change. So our timers disappeared. 
and we realized that client libraries can be broken. You can't trust them always. They are black box, you don't always have control over them. They can do all kinds of nasty stuff, they can have bugs. We need more protection to protect against them. We can turn to thread pool handovers, which is a generic way to make sure that calling threads can always walk away. We can add generic timeouts. The thread pool handover means that all the service calls we will made, we will hand over to a separate thread pool. And we'll wait for a reply from that thread pool. If we don't get a reply, then we can stop waiting for that thread pool to reply to us, and the request thread can walk away. I will clarify with a couple of pictures. So we have the web application with this request thread pool, as before. What we do to employ thread pool handovers is to add another thread pool, a service thread pool. And when we want to call a service, we hand over this job to the service thread pool. We get a future in return, which we wait on. The thread in the service thread pool makes the call to the service, gets the reply, and then with the future returns, and we get the reply in the request thread. Okay? But when the service is slow, if it doesn't respond, for example, if the client library don't have any timeouts anymore, then the request thread can stop waiting on the it can stop waiting for the call in the service thread pool to return. And we can return an error instead. This way our request threads can always walk away. It doesn't matter what the service calls or the client libraries are doing. As an additional bonus, if we have a fixed size service thread pool and we don't enqueue requests, then we get a bulkhead included. If we already have three calls going on to the service, then additional calls will return an error immediately since we can't submit it to the thread pool. This is quite convenient. We get a single construct both for generic timeouts and bulkheads. Okay, we still need timeouts for the service calls, or our thread pools will fill up with blocked threads and all our calls will be rejected. But this will only disable this specific service. It won't block up all the threads in the request thread pool. The thread pool handover can be implemented with a standard Java thread pool executor. In this example, we create one with three threads. The first two threes are the number of threads in the thread pool. And we create it with a synchronous queue. That means that we won't enqueue requests when we submit requests to this thread pool. They will be rejected if, there are all, if all threads are already busy. And when we protect a service using thread pool handovers and this executor, we submit the service calls to the executor. And we get a future in return. And we can wait on this future. Okay, we wait with the time after one second. So if this one second passes, then we can walk away from this service call. If we had a rejected execution exception, it means that the submit call failed because all the threads in the thread pool are already busy. So we throw a rejected by bulkhead exception. We're saying, okay, this is acting as a bulkhead. It's already full. We're already making three concurrent requests. We reject the call immediately, failing fast. If we get a timeout exception, it means that the second passed when waiting for a reply. So we throw a service called timeout exception, but our request thread is free to do other stuff. So these thread pool handovers, they are very powerful. But we were a bit concerned about the performance. Isn't it a bit slow to hand over each service call to a separate thread pool? Well, not really. It turns out that we are making over the wire calls between all our services. The additional overhead of submitting a job to a thread pool in this context is quite ins insignificant. In the rare cases where this would be a performance problem, we're using semaphore bulkheads instead and ensure that we can always trust the client libraries to honor our timeouts.
So we've gotten quite a complex system now. We have a lot of stability patterns. There are a lot of knobs to turn. And also the number of services we've gotten has grown. So we can configure timeouts, bulk head sizes, thread pool sizes. But it's hard to get an overview of the system, and it's hard to detect problems when they are occurring. Where are they occurring? So we need to have some monitoring, but what to monitor? Well, of course, the obvious stuff like heap sizes, CPU usage, and so on. But we also learned that a very good place to introduce monitoring is at the service call la layer. So the service calls, these are the integration points between the services. If you monitor how the service calls are doing, it's easy to, to detect where problems are. It makes it very easy to pinpoint problems. Things to monitor for the service calls are timeout rates. How many of our calls are timing out? If you see an increase in timeout rates, then we probably have problems with the slow service. Also, the rejected call rate, how many calls are being rejected by our bulkheads. If we see an increase in rejected calls, then we might have a problem with an overloaded service. It's also good to monitor the short circuit rate, how many of our calls are being short circuited by our circuit breakers. This is a good way to validate the configuration of when we open the circuit breaker. Overall, failure and success rates for the calls, how many calls fail and how many succeeds. It's a good way to get an indication of the load put on a service. And of course, the classic metric response times, also useful. We found that as a problem indicator, the timeout rate and the reacted call rate are by far the most useful, because as soon as there are some jitters or problems in the system, calls quickly time out or are reacted. Resto response time averages are harder to reason about, but they are useful for drilling down when problems occur. Here we have an example from our monitoring system. It shows the number of failed service calls per minute. The different colors indicate different failure reasons, where green are rejected calls by bulkheads, and red are timed out calls. And as you can see, there are some issues here. We have some rejected calls and some calls that are timing out. But uh, yeah, we have about 100, maybe 200 rejected calls per minute. But in this system, we have several million calls per minute. So having 100, 200 failed calls is no big deal. It's actually expected to have some failures if the bulk head sizes and timeouts are properly configured, because there will always be some jitters in the system. There will be some request spikes, there will be some garbage collections, or maybe some network hiccups. It's to be expected. It would be more worrisome if we never saw any failures, because then we would probably have way too long timeouts and way too large bulkheads. And when we detect problems here, we can quickly drill down to identify which service is failing. When we detect problems here initially, it was quite tempting to run away and change the configuration. Oh, we have rejected calls. Let's increase the bulk head sizes. We have timeouts. Our timeouts are probably too short. We need longer timeouts. But that is a dangerous way to think. Because if we increase the bulk head sizes when we have a problem, we might make things worse. We might overload the service even more if the problem is that it's overloaded. So it's really important to understand problems before changing configuration. Otherwise, problems are probably going to get much worse. OK, so now we introduce some monitoring in this system as well. Three stability patterns and monitoring. Now we're happy. Everything is stable. No major crashes. Services fail, but the system doesn't go down. We've reached planarian state for our system. We can cut away pieces of it, but the organism will continue to live on. We can't regenerate yet, though, but that's for the future. Okay, all this might seem like a lot of work. Fortunately, there is some third-party help you can get. The developers over at Netflix, they have done some awesome stuff. For example, this, the Fort Torres library, Hystrix. Hystrix implements uh, all these stability patterns. They have circuit breakers, they have bulkheads, they have uh, thread pool handovers, and they also add some uh, excellent monitoring capabilities. 
I will show you a quick example of how you can use Hystrix to protect your service calls. Let's assume we want to protect the special offers .get offers call. Then we make a class that extends the Hystrix command class. And we initialize it with a Hystrix command group key. And this group key groups together similar service calls. And by default, it means that commands with the same command group key are assigned to the same bulkhead. And then we override the run method of the Hystrix command. And this is where we make our actual service call. Here we call special offers .get offers. And when we want to call our service protected by Hystrix, we create a new instance of the get offers command and call the execute method of it. By doing this, we get a thread pool handover, which also acts like a bulkhead. And we get a circuit breaker, and we also get recorded metrics for how many, how many calls to the service we make, how many fails, how many successes we get, what are the response times. Hystrix also provide a convenient way to handle errors. We can override the get fallback method, and it will be called every time our run method fails. And we can return an empty offers as a default value in case the service call fails. Hystrix has some uh, real-time monitoring capabilities. We have a nice example from uh, Avanza's dashboard here. I can zoom in a bit on one service. Those are all the Hystrix commands that run from our web application. If we zoom in on one service, we can see the number of successful requests. We can see the number of requests per second. We can see how many service calls have failed for different reasons, all in real time. Quite cool. OK, to sum up. In a microservices system, we have to expect services to fail. There are a lot of moving parts. We have to design our system for failure. We do this by using timeouts to time out all our service calls to prevent blocked threads. We implement circuit breakers to fail fast when our services are faulty. We use bulkheads to limit the number of concurrent calls to our services to prevent failures from cascading and we monitor our service calls to detect problems and to validate configuration. If you want to learn more about these concepts, I recommend you to read the book Release It by Michael T. Newgard. He introduced these patterns in this book and has a lot of other useful information about building stable production systems. Also, the GitHub pages for Hystrix they both contain information about Hystrix, but also some great information about these stability patterns in general. Attributions for all the nice images I have used in this presentation, obligatory. Thank you. That's all from me.